Oh, thanks, Beth, and uh, thanks, everyone. I'll talk as fast as I usually do, so hopefully it uh, doesn't take as long. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about DRGs, uh, and this is a little outline. So I'm going to give you a little primer about DRGs, um, and then I'm going to show you a little bit of data that relates to what I do, which is work as a colorectal surgeon. And I analysed some data back about three years ago when I first got involved in this. And one of these uh, things was what makes a case with catastrophic complications. It sounds horrendous, but that's actually really important because it changes the funding dramatically. We looked at systematic errors in coding. Then I'm going to show you my performance report. So it's a little bit, uh, it's, I only just saw it about two hours ago, and uh, it's from April. It's not the world's best, but I was going to actually go through each column just so people understand. And then I was going to show you something that we've actually done in our unit. So DRGs, are, it stands for Diagnostic Related Groups. Um, the, the version or the, the system that we're using is ANDRG, which is up to version 6 now. And that categorises every medical and hospital admission into 23 categories. And most of these categories, for instance, um, you'll see mine is gastrointestinal and it happens to be G, have a medical and a surgical division. In version 5, there were 3,128 codes. I was quite interested when I actually looked up today about exactly what's in uh, version 6. There's actually only about 680 different codes that our every problem that comes into our hospital is... ...among a spectrum of diseases and disorders that confront us. To actually simplify that into 700 categories, which sounds like a lot, means that it's probably not as specific as some of us would like. An extremely important part of this categorisation is that you'll get a code and then it's either going to be A or B. Um, and if you're an A, that means you've had what, what the classification calls catastrophic complications, which don't, aren't always catastrophic and, and they aren't always what we would consider a complication. Um, but sometimes the difference in funding for an A or a B is a factor of more than, more than double. So it's extremely important that we accurately code what's happening. Category Bs without complications. Coding's done by our coders, some of whom here, I know them personally and have worked with them, and in fact, they helped put together some of this. And to give you an idea of some of the data that we, that we actually see, if I can pull it back on the page, this was uh, the colorectal unit, I think, for three months. So I think there's about 500, I mean, I'm just scrolling down, you don't have to look at this, oh, there's more than 500, we're up to, okay, we're up to 1,000. So this must be a year's worth of data. And it's got their you know, medical record number, their name, when they came, how long they were here for. And then an important thing is, are they an outlier? Because each DRG gets a, a length of stay. Well, there's the patient's stay. This was my patient. He stayed for 99 days. Um, the trim point for his um, particular problem, which is this A06Z, whatever that is, was 60 days. So, in fact, the hospital hasn't been paid for 39 days of his... Uh, of his um, of his stay because it took a long time. And this man was a man who actually started under another surgeon, had horrendous complications uh, related to my uh, area of interest and ended up under my care. He spent, you know, several weeks in ICU ventilated. And the coders then... Actually, I don't know if this guy was mine, but anyway, the coders then sat down and, and have then categorised every diagnosis. And you can see in there, I'm sorry, they're all... Delirium unspecified, disorders of phosphorus metabolism, hypokalemia, acidosis, and they keep going and they keep going and they keep going. And you can see for this poor gentleman, out to 22 different diagnoses, they've actually taken the effort to code. There's one further down the list that's mine where they've actually managed to go out to something like 42 different diagnoses. And then not only do they look at diagnoses, they actually look at procedures and things that we've done therapeutically, be that operating on something. This guy's had a, some sort of horrible lesion out and... He's had this and he's had that. He's had a biopsy of something. He's had an anaesthetic. He's had a block. He's had a scope. He's had some drainage, an operation, cystoscopy. And again, they've categorised this out for, for countless categories. And you could imagine this takes a very long time. They, and they have a, confronted with a massive workload. Yet they do all that. And then what do they do? Well, they read every single page of the notes, they look in the electronic medical record and then they type it into this computer program from 3M Healthcare Informatics and that actually pumps out what DRG it is. Now, I looked at three months of our data in great detail and actually looked at every single admission and tried to work out was it correctly coded, etc. And so from November 2009, we had 165 separations that went into 43 categories. They got a cost weight back then of 
1.67, and that gave our unit this total cost weight, which you could then use this thing called a noir, which you just heard about, which was $4,417 or whatever it is, and then turn it into, theoretically, that's how much money you could be remunerated for doing this work. Interestingly, nine of the DRGs of those 43 actually were 80% of the cost and 70% of the volume, and there were these outliers. So this outlier was mine, where he, or somebody's, where he stayed for 119 days. Trimpoint was that. Again, this A067, which is one of the higher cost-weighted uh, um, procedures because somebody who stays in ICU who's ventilated for, for six or seven days generally has a fairly complicated course. And there's various other little ones there. This is a, a little summary of the data. I wasn't going to go into it too much detail other than to say that, you know, in colorectal, in, a, in, in the average month, we chop out some rectums and half of them come out with complications and half of them don't. And that was their length of stays. And that's how much we got for them. We didn't have outliers there. Uh, we chopped out some small bowel and some other bits of large bowel, chopped out some appendixes, did some operations on your bottom, did a whole variety of colonoscopies. And, and what I thought when I actually analysed this was I actually thought things were remarkably well coded uh, within the limits of the coding system. Um, we were specifically in our unit, we do this horrible operation where we chop out everything in your pelvis and we call that an exenteration. And in that particular month, we didn't actually discharge anyone who'd had an exenteration. And according to me, I thought four of the 165 cases were actually in the wrong DRG. I thought they were... But it, equally, we found people who we'd code up, meaning we'd put them in a DRG where they'd get more money, and there was an equal number who we'd code down where I thought they'd been overcoded. And we found things like... We have to mention things like adhesions and malignant lymph nodes and various things. And, and if we didn't do that, it actually underscored us. So it was really important to be particular in our documentation. So I then went on and, and looked at three months because I was mad and looked at 514 where the average cost weight was this, the total cost weight was that. Again, we had nine DRGs that do most of the cost weight and a large amount of the volume and we had 14 outliers. And if you look at that graphically, this was the, this was the bed day. So this is one way of analysing the data is just seeing how much and so we can see we've had... 18% of our bed days are used up by people who've had a rectal resection. These people who've been ventilated a lot use up, even though there's only a very small number of them, I think there was only one or two, have used up 10% of our bed days. So one patient using 10% of the resources. If we go on and actually look at that at, at how we'd be remunerated using DRGs and, and the sum of the cost weights, again, you get different relationships. So here we're probably a little more efficient because we've got 20% funding, for 18% bed days. Here we were, I think, almost the same. Oh, sorry, we were, we were worse off, sorry, because our, um, we had 10% of our bed days um, and then we've turned it into 6% of our how much budget. So we're actually losing money on this particular patient if you looked at it in those terms. And that was... A, I, I won't go into that. It's getting a little overwhelming. So when we looked at surgeons in our unit, we've got six surgeons. So... And this is their total number of separations. So there's one who had 37, 150... Um, and we could just look at their outlier days. I think this was me. This was my patient with a horrendous number of complications um, who survived, so I was quite pleased about that. Um, and that just gives us a little overview, if you're a head of department, that you could look at, but you've got to do it. In terms of coding errors, there was no single or guaranteed code that would upscale scale you into something that caused you to have catastrophic complications. Our most common problem was that we have patients with stoma bags, it would have a lot of output, it would mean they spend a lot of time in hospital, but there's actually no code, and even if we write down they've got a high output stoma, there was nothing that the coders could write down that would actually upscale this. Yet, these patients can stay in for a week or two additionally, and that clearly is, is, more, um, is more of a problem. One of the other things that became clear, which we will emphasise to people when we're teaching them about DRGs, is causality. So... When somebody gets admitted with a, a gastrointestinal bleed and we find that it's due to this thing called diverticular disease, but we didn't mention it, although we thought that's what it was, it, it can upscale or downscale it. So it was pretty important. Overall, I found 15% significant errors, which I thought was, was 3%. Um, Leanne, who's much more particular than me, recoded all of those herself. She thought there was up to a 10% error rate, but I, I was a little more forgiving. We looked at our exenterations... Um, and these are these horrendous operations. Now, now the problem is there is no code for, a, for an exenteration. So G is uh, colorectal or gastrointestinal, and one is rectal resections with or without complications. There's one with a colon. And you can see some of them were out remarkably quickly with no complications, but some of them there for 62 days and 38 days, and that's when we're not doing as well, and that's where 
you know, we've, we've made applications to get additional funding and, you know, that's hard to know. I think this is all pretty much just said there. Now, um, this, is, this is just a, a little bit of a different example, just going back to um, looking at the national efficient price and, and noirs. And the advantage of the national efficient price and noirs is that you can actually use that to compare different types of hospital presentations or admissions. So this is a little calculation that I stole from the AMA. This isn't the price. The price is less than that. But the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority says that the national equivalent price for amputating a limb has a weight of 4.77. They've set the noir at this amount. So if you had a patient who had this, theoretically, in the future, we'd be getting funded by a combination of state and federal funding to this level. For an emergency department admission, non-admitted, triage category one has got a weight of this much. The price that we'd get for seeing that patient is that much. So we've got to provide the services within that amount of money on a regular basis, all we're doing. For a general medical outpatient service might have this. That's how much money the institution's getting. So they're just examples of, of how this will actually turn into money. Now, this is a uh, probably doesn't project, and I'm going to show you in a lot more detail. This is my uh, clinician length of stay summary from April of this year. Um, and I'll turn it to, or I'll try and turn it to something where we can actually look at it. Um, so it's got the DRG over here. It's got how many of these patients there were, how many of these were same-day episodes, because that's quite important to know, and, and have any of these been uncoded. This is the length of stay, or the average length of stay, and you can see, so for somebody having a hernia, they're in for a day. For somebody who has a rectal resection and has catastrophic complications, for me, for three patients, it averaged out at over two weeks. If they didn't have complications, just to show you the dramatic difference, it's down to six days, so that's pretty dramatic. They then show you, well, this is what your peers are doing. So I'm a little bit better than my peers, so when they have catastrophic complications, uh, they're at 19.7 days and I was 16 at 16.7. And our peers are actually calculated from like hospitals, not just our peers in our immediate hospital, but from like hospitals across the state. The thing I was a little disappointed about is there's various codes here where I'm actually doing a lot worse. And, and the slightly frustrating thing for me is I actually don't know who these people are. And as I said, I've only just seen this report, so I've actually got no idea. Uh, I, I can't say. Now, the other thing that I also quite like is if you look down here, I'm a colorectal surgeon. I've got some patients with blood cell disorders. That's a little confusing. I've got some endocrine disorders. and I've got somebody with a skin graft. And I'd also want to know who those patients are because were they actually mine? And the answer is that they probably are. But what did they actually have to get that DRG? So... In the future, individual clinicians will get reports like this where they can actually look at it. Um, there's other little bits and pieces where they show you how well you're performing compared to your peers. So there I'm 100%, but here I'm only 25%. So this silly DRG that I don't even know what goes into it, other digestive system diagnosis without catastrophic or severe complications, I've got four of, and uh, the average length of stay is 2.2, and I'm getting them out in 4.2 days, but I don't even know what that is. So, you know, in the future, we're going to need the actual data on those patients to actually find out what it was and either why we were doing so badly or is there a better, is there a better DRG that they should have been put into. I think last couple of slides um, is, so what are we going to use DRGs for? Well, in colorectal surgery and in, in gynae oncology, there, there's, there's been this popular move called enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS. In order for us to do that, we got one of our senior nurses who actually educates the patients before they, hit, they meet us. We do things before surgery, during surgery, and in their recovery post-operatively. And there's good data around the world that by doing that, we can get people out of hospital significantly faster. And in our unit in 2011, so for patients who went on that program, they get out in 8.4 days versus 11.3, or 11 compared to 17, or 4.6 compared to 6.4, by instituting these relatively simple measures Better than that, this year's data shows that we're continuing to improve in terms of that, that people are getting out faster and faster. And, and one of the problems with this is this data we've actually recorded by hand. We're not using our, um, our DRGs and all of that sort of stuff because that information wasn't really available. But in the future, for all of you who are clinicians, you'll actually be getting data where you can actually look at it and then you can institute changes and you can do it scientifically if you want and randomise or, or whatever you want to do. And, you know, and that has a, a fairly significant um, impact on what we can do because if we can treat more of these and more efficiently, where we're actually now getting them home twice as fast as we were two years ago, 
That means we've got more empty beds. Well, they're not empty, they're filled by the next body, but it actually allows us to treat more patients for the same amount of money. Which brings me to my last slide. A lot of people were all under the preconceived idea, if I do a lot of this DRG, I'll get a lot more money. But the answer is, the reason why ABF is coming in is because there is in fact a finite pot of money. We can't keep spending money indefinitely. And so more activity doesn't necessarily translate into increased dollars. And what it will ultimately do over time, both across the state but also within institutions, is result in redistribution of where money goes. And I think the major point of this is that, um, that it measures activity and then we can use that to guide service provision, efficiency and outcomes and then give much better clinical care. And at the end of the day, I, I, I very much like um, Bethan's talk because at the end of the day, although we've talked about numbers, DRG, statistics, length of stay and all that sort of stuff, in fact, at the end of the day, it's about providing the best possible care we can provide for our patients. Thanks for your attention.